Psalm 12 asks a question that you could even ask today. It says, where are the faithful? They vanished from the land. And God had redeemed his people out of Egypt. He made a covenant with them. He was faithful to his part of the covenant, but they were not faithful to their part. So back in the day, it was really hard to find a faithful saint. Now, two of them, Joshua and Caleb, uh, they were about ready to enter the promised land. And a couple millennia later, someone writes a song, Where Are All the Faithful Men? Uh, they actually are hard to find. Uh, the Marines are looking for a few good men, but God is looking for faithful saints. And there aren't a whole lot of them around. So what I would encourage you to do is a study on your own. Uh, type the word faithful into a Bible software program and just kind of get a feel for uh, the faithfulness of God and the lack of faithfulness of men and women who propose or purport to follow him. This sermon I did back in 94. Um, I have no idea what I said back then. It was the beginning of a series on Ephesians. And Paul addresses the Ephesians as he does also the Colossians and some other groups of believers as saints who are faithful. So I'd like to take a little bit look at what a saint is. You know, St. Patrick's Day is coming up. Uh, guy goes around casting snakes out of Ireland. It would probably be a good idea of a saint. Um, but New Testament believers are called saints. The root idea behind the word saint is holy. It's actually the word for holy, uh, holy ones. And holy is used to refer to God. It's used to refer to a patch of dirt, uh, a bowl that was used in the temple service. And it's used to refer to the Old Testament believers and the New Testament believers. So the root idea behind the word holy is separate or distinct. <clears throat> so you have to ask the question, separate or distinct from what? Well, my favorite way to think about this is the patch of ground that God told Joshua, you know, take your sandals off the place where you're standing is holy ground. And you have to kind of think, wait, holy dirt? What, what, what's that? What, what I don't understand. And it was God's presence made that piece of dirt separate or distinct from any others. It was the fact that God had dedicated, or uh, King David or Solomon had dedicated a bowl for use in the tabernacle or temple, made it separate or distinct from all other bowls, hence it was separate. The people of God are supposed to be called separate or distinct from those around them. Uh, they have a different set of beliefs, a different set of knowledge, a different set of values, a different feelings and different actions than those around them. The thing that makes you a saint is that you have a separate or distinct belief uh, that Jesus is your Savior, he is your God, he is your Lord, he is the one that you need to follow, trust, and obey. Um, your knowledge is going to increasingly make you separate or distinct from those around you. And then your feelings and values need to shift as well to those of a person who follows the God of this world, uh, to, to one of the God who follows the, I mean, the one who follows the God of all worlds, the Lord Jesus. And of course, you have different actions. I gathered these four characteristics that follow from the book of Ephesians, <clears throat> based on the emphasis uh, in that book, from way back when, when we went through it. And the A stands for a saint always acts in love. Actually, always supposed to act in love, but um, that's a big theme. God chose us that would be perfect and blameless in the sphere of love. And if you understand the book of Ephesians, it's love for each other mentioned multiple times in the book. Another thing that makes a believer separate in addition to their belief and their actions is that they are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Chapter 1, verse 13 says, you heard, uh, you believed, and you were sealed with the spirit of promise. And for a lot of people, that little flickering light of the spirit is buried so deeply, you don't see it because they've kind of overlaid it with all kinds of other junk. But for a saint who's really holy, 
the fact that they are indwelt by the Holy Spirit shows, it shows up in their actions, the things that they will uh, attempt to do for God and others. A saint is someone who is not limited by circumstances or what you can see uh, because they believe in a God who is invisible, who is beyond the normal realm of our comprehension. <clears throat> and <clears throat> if we just try to believe in God on a purely physical, uh, touch, see, taste, smell, sensor kind of approach, you will always be limited. You have to look beyond the um, earthly to the transcendent to understand that God is, you know, unlimited. And last but not least, particularly in Ephesians 4, one of the characteristics of a saint is that when equipped, they truth it in love. They speak the truth to one another uh, so that they build up the other person. So that's the basic idea behind a saint. Uh, it's another good study, to, but uh, doing faithful is probably more profitable off the bat. So I'd like to key in a little bit about the belief factor that makes us different or distinct from those around us. This guy. Okay. And I'm going to ask a very basic question. What do you believe about Jesus? Now, a person who doesn't really know Jesus well would say, oh, he's just an historical figure. A person who's been to church is going to say something like, oh, he's a sin bearer. Uh, a person who actually believes that he is their personal sin bearer will be a person who can say, he is my savior. And that's about where most people, unless they start reading the scriptures or go to a church that equips people to do so, would stop. They kind of maybe hear that he's coming back. Uh, they're not really sure what he's going to do, come back to take us to heaven. Uh, no, if you understand the scriptures, he's coming back to set up his kingdom on earth and to judge and pay back the good and the bad among his people. And uh, I think one of the pinnacles of what to believe about Jesus is that he is the Lord God. As Paul writes to the church at Rome, he is the son of David, the Messiah, the right to rule, but he's also the son of God, the right to be obeyed in all things. So a little point of application here. How do you respond to what you believe about Jesus? Um, you know, sure, I trust him from my death payment for my sin. Totally. I don't want to have to die. But do I really trust him to guide and rule and direct and control my life? And I suspect that the answer to that question for most people who call themselves Christians is no. They do not trust that God has their best interests at heart. They do not trust that he can do with his their life whatever he wishes uh, because they've kind of bought into a uh, worldly view of God as opposed to the spiritual, biblical view of God. So we're going to spell Lord. This is back in the day when I used to kind of work on my sermons as I was walking around. So uh, I carried my outline in my head. And when I, when I think of Jesus as Lord, I, I think of him the one is the one who goes before me. He leads me. And I follow him. Uh, that's what he invited people to do. If you want to come after me, deny yourself, give up what you've got, and follow me. And back in the day, it was really easy to see who were the disciples or followers because they were the people who literally followed after Jesus. Also part of being his Lord is that he can leave you right where you are, like Joseph being left in prison for all those years, from one bad situation to another. Uh, God had a plan, and that's where, you know, Joseph... Uh, worked out his followership of the Lord by being in prison, waiting for the time when God would release him and use him to rescue his people. Or he can launch you. He can send you out. Uh, whatever he wants, that's what we want. And I think that sometimes he tells the disciples, let's go somewhere else. Then at other times he sent them out. And then he even put restrictions on where they were to go. Like, do not go to the Gentiles. Only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Um, this leading requires close following, and we just cannot just you know, have our idea of what it means to follow Jesus and then just go. We need to, moment by moment, be depending on him. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't rely on your own limited human understanding, 
but in all your ways acknowledge, and I be put submit to him, acknowledge him as your Lord, and he will direct your paths. And the paths might go left, right, sideways, back, retrace, wherever he wants, that's where we go. Which brings us to the second point, part of lordship is he orders our every step. He orders our thoughts. He orders our values. He orders our desires. He orders our feelings. And this is underscored by his call to discipleship in Luke 9 and the other spots where he's got it. If you want to follow, step number one is to deny yourself. Not deny yourself ice cream or, you know, some goodie, but to deny you the very right to your life because it's no longer your life. It's his. We'll see that in a few minutes. Um, and he can remove or add anything to your life. He can remove things you like, add things you don't like. He, he can rearrange the furniture. But Lord, I like that chair over there. No, that's not the best spot for it. He can reverse your expectations. Oh God, you know, you've always done things this way. I mean, how can this be you? You're, you're changing what I expected of you. Um, I think Job was a great example of that, um, where he had this expectation that God would uh, protect and bless him. And yes, God was protecting and blessing him, but you know, it didn't look like that to Job. My, my favorite verse on this is Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. This might actually just be before the Garden. Um, it's Our will is like irrelevant anymore, except for following what God wants. So whatever you want, God, I'm yours. Do whatever you wish. Final aspect of lordship, which I think a lot of people, if they're honest, would really struggle with, is he can demand the difficult, even your death, but more commonly, your life. So Romans 12, 1 and 2 has the life thing. We're supposed to offer our lives, present our lives, put ourselves at Christ's disposal on a daily basis as an ongoing sacrifice. And there, this is something you probably need to come to grips with. There's going to be a time where you need to think about being a faithful martyr like Antipas uh, in Revelation 2.10, where you are faithful to death. And uh, the neat thing, if you understand the context of that verse, is someone who is faithful to death gets the crown of life. Um, God reverses everything that can happen on this earth and turns it into something that is wonderful for an eternity for us. And I think... You know, one of the pieces that helped me um, progress on my Christian life is I came to grips with the fact that, yeah, following Jesus could result in my death. All right, am I willing to do that? And uh, it was a little bit of a struggle, but once I died to self on that regard, uh, it became a whole lot easier. So are all these things true about what you believe about Jesus as your coming King, Judge, and Lord God? Uh, if not, they should be things that you should start figuring out. All right, how do I make that more a part of my life? Envision some of the worst consequences and then say to God, and God, if that's what you want, that's okay. Because you're God and I'm not, you know what's best. So I'm not going to read through all this because that's going to take too long, but this is a... New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology, uh, by Colin Brown, three-volume set. And uh, it's kind of, <coughs> excuse me, a, a condensation of a uh, big ten-volume set by Kittle called the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. And they had this article on faithfulness, and I, I like this stuff because it gives you access to things that you wouldn't normally find in a concordance. And their perception of faithfulness is that it's a consistent, sacrificial loyalty. And I added, with obvious results. The fact that you are loyal to God shows up in the things that you do. And faithfulness is consistent. And it also requires sacrifice. Their definition was dependability of those bound through an agreement or conduct that honored a bond. So God kind of makes a covenant with his people, both testaments uh, he promises to do certain things, and we have to do certain things in response. Um, it's, a, it's a bilateral covenant, and we have 
responsibilities. And this is consistent with the Stoics. Uh, the Stoics believe that the purpose of life was to serve the divine spark in your fellow man. And so this definition that man's fidelity to his moral destiny leads to fidelity towards others. Interesting little thing on the mystery religions. These are uh, the religions that kind of were going on in Greece and uh, around the time of the New Testament. And uh, it's they're a pretty good counterfeit of Judaism and Christianity because besides Christianity and Judaism, there are basically only the relig relig mystery religions that stand out in their demand of faith in their divinities. It's not just ritual. It's not um, just practice. You actually have to have a faith in the divine being and in the revelations and teachings delivered by them. And the mystery religion concept of uh, salvation was divinization. In other words, you become a divinity. And Second Peter tells us God gives us these promises that we might become partakers of the divine nature. So it's a very clever, um, oh, what do you call it, counterfeit that Satan came up with. And uh, most people don't even, uh, you know, live with that, you know, pr expectation in Christianity. Uh, even though Satan knew back then that that's what Christianity was all about. Uh, Origen, an early church uh, apologist, had made this comment. Uh, all the, these religions had the same demand. Believe if you would be saved or be gone. Um, so this is a guy called Sellis, uh, who, if you look at him on Wikipedia, you'll find an interesting little article. But I don't have time for that. Uh, Qumran, these are where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. This is the Jewish sex in between Malachi and Matthew. And he talks about uh, God saving the saints, the holy ones, the separate ones, from the house of judgment on account of their suffering and their faithfulness to the teacher of righteousness. So there's an expectation that the teacher of righteousness would come and those who were faithful to him would be spared judgment. Uh, faithfulness to the teacher means holding to the knowledge revealed to him and the revelation of this eschatological truth, which means this is what's going to happen when the teacher of righteousness comes, the Messiah comes back, uh, was at the same time the requital of obedience and disobedience. In other words, he pays back obedience and he pays back disobedience. And as uh, Syriac something or other says, he who believes will receive a reward. So understanding that there is a Lord who's coming back to judge and reward and pay back, uh, is an incentive to our faithfulness, and we want to make sure that we're going to be doing well in the future. Okay, questions thus far? Okay, if none, we can break in at any time. I want to look at what aids and hinders faithfulness. And uh, under Roman numeral 4, faithfulness develops from a conviction that Jesus is who he said he is and will do what he said he'll do. So this is a take on Hebrews 11.6. Uh, you have to have faith if you want to please God because he or she who comes to God must believe that he is. And uh, we, we elaborate on that, is who he said he is. And is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He'll do what he said he'll do. And if you believe that, then it would make sense that you would, A, trust in who he said he is, and B, diligently seek him so you'll be rewarded. And by this definition, I would say the masses of Christianity don't really have faith that pleases God because they aren't diligently seek him. They don't believe in reward. They don't take him at his word. Uh, they are not full of faith in who God revealed himself to be, uh, which I'm sure is a little disappointing to Jesus because he went to a lot of trouble to kind of show that he was trustworthy. Faithfulness also develops from the conviction that uh, Jesus has saved my life and I owe it all to him. So writing to the uh, carnal Christians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, uh, Paul reminds them that they were bought with a price. Therefore, they needed to glorify God with their body and spirit, which are God's. 
a spot where bad believers are criticized for uh, following the lust of their minds as well, which is probably included in the idea of spirit in this writing. So he saved my life. I owe it all to him. Therefore, he can do with it as he wishes. Now, Lord, what do you want your servant to do? Um, and then we will be faithful to do what he has said. And the Apostle Paul is a great example of that. He's fought the good fight. He's finished the course. He's kept the faith. And the, the faith there is not Paul saying at the end of his life, yeah, and I still believe that Jesus died for my sins. Now, the faith is the whole body of what Christ taught that we are supposed to believe that he is coming back to reward and judge. And those who have laid up treasure in heaven will be joyful and happy. Those who have squandered what God has given them will be unhappy. This thing. Here's one I think is really worth uh, giving some more thought to. Let's see if I can get this. There it is. Faithfulness develops from a conviction that there is no better system or approach to enjoying this life and the next. No better approach to living this life, enjoying it, and enjoying the next. Romans 12 says, if you present yourselves to God as this ongoing living sacrifice, which we referenced up earlier, you will be able to prove in your life what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. If you're not kind of doing that, you're basically saying that you know better than God. And you haven't been able to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to be able to make that claim. God's way is best, even if it involves suffering, even if it involves things we don't like. He knows what's best for us. We don't. And we demonstrate incredible hubris to say, oh, I know better than God. Um, that is really a lie from the pit. So understanding that God's way is the right way, we have a responsibility to him. And I just popped down a bunch of things that started with P. Um, you can make up your own. But a responsibility to his person, uh, I, loyalty, uh, defending his reputation, uh, giving my time to him to spend as he wishes. That's part of a relationship, and we need to basically um, be faithful to him. People kind of miss out on the whole purpose thing, and what they do is they pick up on the precepts. Those are just specific things. So the Pharisees are a great example of this. You pick and choose what you want to obey. Take some easy things like, you know, washing your hands and uh, looping off on the Sabbath, and then you, you're, you're good. You can do whatever you want with the rest of your life. No, that's not quite right. There's also the principles. <coughs> so I did a sermon once upon a time. Uh, what would Jesus have me do? Uh, so people were really big on wearing bracelets said, what would Jesus do? And uh, I think the better question is, what does he want us to do? And this requires work, because to go from the specific to the general principle, you actually have to apply brain power. Think about what's the principle behind it. And a lot of people just skip right over the principles because they're not specific enough for them. And they don't recognize that every specific is tied into a principle in order to accurately apply the scripture. We need to um, study the principles behind why we should do what God wants us to do. So when you are reading like a passage in Proverbs and you think, oh, none of this applies, you just have to go one step above that to say, okay, what are the principles behind that? And then applications will jump out all over the page on you, a daily truth baseless just you know, smattering of them. There's so much more there. I have a responsibility to his power. So this goes back to one of the things under the uh, mystery religions <laughs> that it was considered being disloyal to a sojourn or greater power if you would look to anyone or anything else for your protection. So God specifically gets upset in the uh, Old Testament when Egypt is put in his place and Israel looks to Egypt to protect them rather than to the God who delivered them out of Egypt and brought them into the promised land. And the reason they would not trust in God's power is because they had kind of turned their back on God and uh, didn't think that he would provide for them. 
And that's actually true today. You look and you see a person who's not trusting God. Um, you see a person who's not living so that God would be able to bless them. And, you know, whatever else people are, they're not incredibly stupid. They believe, yeah, you know, but if I'm disobeying God and I'm not giving him my whole life, then I really have no right to be asking him for help. So if you find yourself in that situation, what you need to do is confess it, repent, change your mind, and say, okay, God, uh, I want to do things your way. Whatever you want to do with my life, it's yours. Please help. And last but not least, uh, you want to have a responsibility to his perspective. And I really wanted his vision. So what's on his heart is on your heart. What he desires for the world and those around you is what you desire as well. And if you have his perspective on what life is about, then you will be much more faithful to believe him and fulfill your responsibilities uh, that you have to him. Any questions on that one? It's a verse I use a couple times in this outline, uh, Luke 10, 27. When Jesus comes back, um, those who um, have not been ashamed of him, he will not be ashamed of. Those who have been ashamed of him, he will be ashamed of when he comes with his father's angels and passes out the glory. Um, it's, it's not going to happen in your corner because you haven't been doing the things that are glory-gaining behaviors. Right. Uh, your purpose would fit in there, too, for purpose perspective. Yeah, good point. Mm -hmm. So we want to look at life from his perspective, which would embrace his purpose, his vision, his plans. Uh, you know, why are we here on Earth? What's the point? Uh, we have a responsibility to figure that out and uh, work with it. It's kind of like a good employee uh, doesn't just do whatever their boss says, and when if their boss has not told them specifically what to be doing for those you know, next five minutes, they just go do their own thing. Um, but a good employee is one who kind of looks, anticipates, understands what their boss wants, and is always working on furthering the agenda of the company. Um, they also are very rare and have basically vanished from the land as well. Okay, so now we got three little things, or yeah, four, four things that will enhance our faithfulness. So Psalm 116.12 says, don't forget all God's benefits towards yourself. Count them, list them, uh, develop a sense of gratitude. It's amazing, in a lot of my uh, you know, reading this year, I, I see so much is written about the importance of gratitude. And uh, most people thank themselves or them around them. They don't recognize that all that stuff actually goes back to thanking God. So if you are reflecting on his benefits to you, <coughs> if you're having you know, trouble with your quiet time, just you know, take, start listing all the things that uh, God has done for you, for which you are grateful, and it will you know, basically give you much to praise him for. So number one, the experience of God's protection and power towards me enhances my faithfulness towards him because I realize, oh, wow, look at all that he's done for me. What's you know, the least I can do in terms of responding? The second one, um, this came from a book, a line in a book called uh, My Utmost for His Highest by Oswald Chambers. Um, it's still around. Actually, a biography of him has recently come out. And the concept is the enjoyment of abandoning yourself to him and finding him faithful. And this is an enjoyment that I don't think many people actually get because many people don't abandon themselves to him. So uh, a couple weeks ago, I was I found myself in the Lazy River. <laughs> and... Uh, there's a little spot where you see these kids that are you know, three or so, four, maybe years old. And uh, they're standing on the bank of the Lazy River, which is cement. And they have the parent down, you know, below in the river, like three feet down, if that. And the parent's holding the arms out to the kid, and they're telling the kid to jump. 
and then the kid isn't sure if they should do it. The parent gives them a little more encouragement, and finally the kid kind of jumps, and then the squeal of delight when the parent actually catches them. And uh, then, of course, there's do it again, do it again. And the kid kind of you know, goes over to the side with their quarter wings and gets back up, and four parents are there for like hours catching the kids. Uh, there's a kind of, oh, um, was it warm feeling? I don't know what it is, but it, it's just that when you find out that you can trust someone and uh, they don't abandon or forsake you, then there is a joy from that because it kind of maybe underscores your sense of worth or value. I don't think any of the four-year-olds were actually thinking that, but they were probably thinking that, hey, this is fun, fly through the air and I don't drown. So Psalm 910 says, uh, those who know your name will put their trust in you for you have never abandoned or forsaken those who trust you. And that means when you start you know, looking at times in your life, particularly if when times are difficult, to realize that God is faithful and he invites us to trust him and you can trust him and he has not forsaken you. He still provides all you need, he still cares for you, he still loves you, he still has purpose for you and all that other good stuff. Then you should want to be faithful. Uh, remember from last time, a you know, element of intimacy is reciprocity. And uh, you want to, he's been faithful to you, you want to be faithful to him, and the relationship grows. Uh, just like a human relationship where there's no reciprocity, it doesn't grow, actually deteriorates. Sim similarly in his, our spiritual relationship with God, as we trust him and find him faithful, there is great joy and uh, additional desire to trust him and intimacy grows. Another thing that enhances your faithfulness is hanging around a body of believers where they engage in something called exhortation. Um, sometimes this word is translated encouragement. Uh, rarely is the translation uh, comfort proper. It means to call alongside. And uh, a passage that is pretty significant in Hebrews 3 is addressed to the body of believers. So most of you know Hebrews was written to Hebrew believers who had trusted in the Messiah and now were being pressured by their neighbors, friends, family, co-workers, bosses, everyone around them, religious leaders, to come back to Judaism and be unfaithful to the Messiah. So the author of Hebrews writes, take heed, be on your guard, watch out, that there not be an evil heart of unfaithfulness in departing from the living God. Just stop right there and think about that for a second. Why would anyone ever depart from a relationship with the living God, the creator of heaven and earth? Why would you ever do that? Because Satan has blinded you. What's the corrective? The body is to exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest you be hardened through in your unbelief. So hanging around a body of believers is a plan by God to um, prevent us from being deceived and buying into some of Satan's lies and wind up departing from the living God and missing the things that he has in store for us. Um, I don't think most Christians actually take this seriously, that they have a responsibility to exhort one another uh, in Holy Spirit-inspired sensitivity and love. Okay, number four, which was not in the original outline, but <coughs> I put it uh, some of the stuff here. In the back of toil, since we're going to be judged based on our faithfulness, yeah, the yeah, parable of talents, well done, good and faithful servant, Paul said, I have kept the faith. He was faithful. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4.2, it's required stewards that they be found faithful. Uh, you know, blessed is the faithful servant who the master finds doing what he's supposed to be doing when he comes back. The idea behind a steward is that you have been given something as a trust. That's what a steward is. And you need to use it according to the purposes of for which it is given. So at the end of toil, I've got you know, Semper Fi, always faithful, and then I, then I start breaking it down. Um, some of them don't have outlines that go with them. But here's just a smattering of them. Uh, 
one that everyone struggles with is stewardship of your time. And uh, it was reflecting on this that I came up with the definition that time is the interval during which you get blessed or cursed. Uh, you exchange the time for something that is good for an eternity or bad for an eternity. So what do you do with your time? Uh, money, uh, if you're not faithful in the least, you're not going to be faithful in the most. Uh, money is actually just a marker that God gave as a means of recognizing that it all comes from him. And Solomon at the dedication of the temple, when people are bringing so much stuff, you have to, they have to say, just like they did when they did the tabernacle, stop, we don't have room for it. Keep it. We don't want it. Um, Solomon prays, Lord, all this stuff came from you. And this is particularly true in they were building a tabernacle because God said, ask the Egyptians for gold money before you leave. So how did they get their money? They just obeyed what God said to do. And then when they're doing the temple, uh, they got their money from something very similar. God said, drive out the, the pagans. And uh, God brought all kinds of spoil into them. Uh, the nation, and then that was used to uh, build the temple. He's given you strength. He's given you talent. Um, you know, once you understand that so much of what we are is innate, where did it come from? At the age of one, you didn't decide, oh, I'm going to develop that talent. Oh, no, God wired that into you, Psalm 139. Um, so that stuff, what do you have that's not yours? God wired you together to perform certain acts of service. So Ephesians 2.10. Faithfulness with the truth. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.2. Uh, 2, it probably is listed down below. You know, the things that you've heard, the presence of many witnesses, commit that same stuff to faithful people who are going to teach others also. Uh, the truth is not just given for your benefit. The truth is given so you can pass it on to others in your service of God. Your family background experiences, you know, where you were born, uh, same family situation, something you need to be a good steward of. There's certain people that you have an ability to reach that others don't based on your experience. Your education, that's another thing to be faithful of. How are you going to use what God has given you, those relationships as well as knowledge? Um, <coughs> probably this is under talents. What, everything that you've been entrusted to, uh, resources, your very life, yourself, uh, Galatians 5.13, you've been called to liberty. Don't use the liberty. You don't have to follow the Old Testament law like they did. Uh, but don't use that liberty as an opportunity to indulge your desires, but to love, serve one another. And then there's opportunities that God brings your way. Things that, you know, people you meet. Um, things that he just drops in your lap. Uh, you can actually get to the point where you're seeking out, okay, God, this is how a lot of missionaries got in the field, uh, where do you want your servant to be deployed? How, how can I serve your purposes on this earth? What do you want what do you want me to be? It is not a suggestion that you be faithful, but it is required and that means you're going to have to give an account. And when you realize that you have to give an account and to whom much is given much is required, you really start getting on the track for being faithful because God's going to say, so Bill, what did you do with the stuff that I gave you? And I'm going to say, well, Lord, your servant was busy here and there and everything. No, that's not going to work. So uh, God knows everything, and one day everything will be revealed. We kind of want to be prepared for it, so you're not caught by surprise. So <coughs> that can increase our faithfulness. Yes, go ahead. Right, totally. So, uh, yeah, that probably I originally had that under exhortation. Um, and, yeah, you put down, um, throw body members in here. That's a good one. Okay. Thanks. So faithfulness diminishes or decreases due to hanging around a system that's going in the wrong direction. Satan is actively trying to diminish and decrease and extinguish your faithfulness. Are you going to let him? The, to the degree you, to which you are immersed in his world system, you will have his values, and that, or those are contradistinction to God's values. And 1 John 2.16 says, 
all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, <coughs> um, the desire for other things, and the pride of life, uh, all those things, are not of the Father, but are of the world. And the thing that prevents the word from bearing fruit is it's choked out by stuffing ourselves with what Satan has to offer. This does not mean you, you know, put on a hair shirt and eat locust and honey and, you know, live out in the desert. But you're supposed to be in the world, not of the world. You're living in this world, but your source of motivation and desire and all that other stuff comes from um, your relationship with Jesus Christ. And to the degree that you are not immersed in Jesus and his word, you will be immersed in Satan and his world system, and you will not be faithful to the God who created and redeemed you. Forgetfulness and ingratitude. In the last days, people are going to be very ungrateful, and uh, that's surely the case. <clears throat> Psalm 103, verse 2 says, Forget not all his benefits. And then three Psalms later, They soon forgot his works. And were not grateful. We didn't remember how bad it was in Egypt. They didn't remember that they called out to God and that God answered them. They, they didn't remember how he brought them through the Red Sea and trashed his enemies. They don't, didn't remember how he fed them in the wilderness. Yeah, they, so we have just bad memories. So uh, if we are reviewing both the scriptures and God's work in our lives, we will uh, not forget them. So here's the thing I mentioned up above, and it's worthy of repetition, because this, I think, is a huge problem with folks. We think we know better than God. Or we think we can do a better job managing our lives than God can. Okay, finite, puny human with, you know, limited sight and strength. Um, what makes you think that you can do a better job than the almighty, all-wise, all-powerful architect of the inside of your life and the outside of your universe and everything else. Well, the reason I think that is because I have a different value than God does. Yeah, so um, I didn't get what I wanted from God, so I can get it myself. Right. Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool says in their heart, where they make their decisions, that there is no God. There is no room for what God wants where you make your decisions. That is pride. That's kind of what got Satan in trouble and uh, will surely, unless you repent of it, get you in trouble as well. And of course, that's a form of sin or rebellion, breaks fellowship, you get shame, builds independence. Independence is the essence of sin. And uh, God seems far away. Guess who moved? So Genesis 3.9, I always think of this one. God's playing hide and seek with Adam in the garden. Adam, where are you? Here I come, ready or not. You know, it's like God obviously knows where Adam is. He's trying to bring Adam to a recognition of, uh, Adam, you have moved away and hidden from me, so we don't have a relationship. And of course, you know, the blame game and everything else that goes on in there, you can read about it in Daily Truth Base. So if we are um, not pleased with God, we don't like what God has done for us. Um, we are even bitter at God that he didn't give us what we want. Rather than try to figure out how what he gave us is actually better for us, we just say, okay, God, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give you what you want because you won't give me what I want. It's like, oh, how silly, people. But we do that. And uh, we get bitter at God. And that's another sermon. I actually might cover some of that next week. So any other thoughts on what diminishes faithfulness? All things that are bad. Okay, now I guess I think we get the spell. Oh yeah, we get the spell faithful. Yeah, that's uh, you know, that's actually coming up next. So that's a that's a major point because um, <coughs> we have to believe that God is going to judge and reward, and it's going to be worth it. So let's take a look and see where it comes up. In order to be faithful, I must fix my heart, mind, will, values, emotions, to follow regardless of the cost. 
This was a characteristic of our Lord Jesus. Um, he, in the New Testament, set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem to be obedient unto death. Actually, a verse in Isaiah 50, verse 7, says the same thing. And a flint is a really hard, fixed rock. And uh, Jesus was going to go to Jerusalem and die regardless of how he felt about it, regardless of what others said, he was going to follow. And we kind of need to make that decision. We are going to uh, follow regardless. We don't want to be one of those who said, oh, let me go first do this. Oh, let me first do that. Or, you know, it's, we don't want to turn back. We want to follow faithful to the end. Um, we need to abandon and avoid anything or anyone that will hold me back or trip me up. <laughs> so Luke 9, uh, 23, one of the calls to discipleship, things that you have to leave, in some cases to follow Christ's will for your life, um, are listed there. I can commend the passage to you if you haven't looked at it lately. And then a prudent man perceives evil and hides himself, avoids it. So anything that you think will trip you up, build some safety nets, prevent that from happening. Inquire into Jesus' expectations and desires for you in all things. So, Lord, like, why did you save me? Uh, what do you want of me? Why did you make me thus? Uh, how can I live for you? What good works did you prepare for me? Um, how do you want me to interact with this person or that person or some other person. Um, we want to basically know what his expectations are so we can hit them. Uh, as opposed to say, oh, Jesus, like you should have told me. And he'll probably say, well, yeah, I actually did. It was in my word if you paid any attention to it. And there's another one of the passages, uh, like the one in Luke, Mark uh, 8.38. We're ashamed of him. He'll be ashamed of us. What? He won't think I'm wonderful just because I accepted him? Read the passage and see what it says. This is one that could get me in trouble if I don't explain it. <clears throat> Trust that if I do my part, he'll do his part. Oh, it's all of Jesus. Well, not necessarily. He provides all you need to do his will, but you still have to take what he gives you and use it. So our trust or expectation is if I figured out what God's will is and I do my part, he will do his part. Um, and he will provide all I need to do his will. So in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God's able to make all grace abound to you that you have in all sufficiency. Uh, and all things can abound to every good work. So God gives you the grace. That's power, folks. That's not the unmerited favor. That's something that you need to seek. And he'll give you all you need. Uh, Philippians 4, my God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So we basic, some people just sit there and say, oh man, yeah, that's nothing I can do. It's just like, you know, I'm just limited. But a saint is someone who is not limited. If God wants you to do it, he will give you the strength to do it. Uh, help others along the way as I seek their help and encouragement. So I quoted uh, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, I pass on to others. Ephesians 4 and uh, actually chapter 5 is you know, a major body life passage about how um, you mutually build up other members of the body and they build you up and we get courage to follow Christ from each other. Similarly, Philippians 2, at the same mindset that was in Christ Jesus, you look out for others' interest. And, uh, you know, if you, if you have a group of people each looking out for someone else's interest, then nobody gets left behind. Uh, fulfill all his commands and expectations for me. Nothing left undone. Yikes, that sounds like it's difficult. Um, so, where do I get that? Parable of the talents. <clears throat> God had an expectation for the servants to uh, use what he gave them for his purposes. And he was not pleased with those who didn't. He was very pleased with those who um, did do that. So we need to be looking at the scriptures like, well, what does God want of me? And that's one of the questions you should ask yourself every time. And I kind of 
prompted you to do that in Daily Truth Base. What, what does God want? What can I expect from him? What does he expect from me? And uh, how do I do it? So we don't want to have left stuff undone, um, but we want to figure out what God wants us to do and do it. And if we've done it, then we can face the future with confidence. <clears throat> So I needed another you, unabashedly brag about how good my Lord is. Um, we don't want to be ashamed of him. We want to make him look good. Um, we want to sensitively be able to praise God and uh, in such a way that others will trust him. Most of you know that's the background to the Psalms, where you were in trouble, you called out to God for help, you vowed to praise him, he helped, you would gather up your family and friends and prime rib and take it down to the temple, have a picnic and a barbecue and talk about how good your Lord was. Um, I think I was first I was going to put in here was the ungrateful lepers union uh, when Jesus healed uh, 10 of them and only one comes back and Jesus is there. Um, weren't there like uh, nine others? I, I don't know what happened to them. So uh, we don't want to be ashamed to say how God has helped us. And then the biggie, <clears throat> look to the future payoff. Something that lasts for an eternity outweighs anything, regardless how great, that only lasts temporally. So the faithful will abound with blessings. God will bless the faithful. That's what he does. Um, the Lord will render righteousness and his faithfulness to those who are righteous and faithful. And in... Near the end of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, after the parable, Jesus says, Who then is that faithful and wise servant? Oh, man, I don't have to be faithful now. I just have to be wise. Wow. Well, being wise helps you be faithful because you figure out what the objectives are and, and the right means of obtaining them and why they're important and how to do them. <coughs> <coughs> Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find him so doing. So what will the Lord find you doing when he returns? Uh, this was a, a big thought in uh, my students up at New York School of the Bible. And uh, kind of the thought was, wow, when Jesus comes back, you don't want to find him finding you sinning. You want to be doing something that he likes. And that kind of morphed into, well, if I've done something wrong and he didn't come back, then I got away with it. And, yeah, you know, God, all wise, all knowing, you know, every, everything you have to give an account for. So um, that kind of breaks down there. But we want to get blessed. It makes a whole lot more sense than getting cursed. And we do so um, by being faithful and wise and doing what he wants. And, of course, I've shared this verse multiple, multiple times. Uh, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, you were faithful over a few things. Be ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of your Lord. <laughs> so the risk of repeating this ad nauseum, uh, some of the things that come out of this is you've got to have done something. You've got to have done it well. You've got to have been good. You've got to be faithful. And you've got to be a servant. And then the elaboration is... Faithful in the little stuff is required before God entrusts true riches to you. And here, one of those true riches is ruler over many things in the future kingdom. And entering into the joy of the Lord is uh, something that we should all aspire to. And if you read Isaiah, not Ezekiel 45, you realize that there are some priest in the millennial kingdom who are there preparing and offering the sacrifices, but because they were unfaithful, they do not get to go into the Holy of Holies in the actual presence of God in the millennial kingdom. And that's a passage like, it must not be in most people's Bibles because you don't hear much about that. A few uh, verses to the downside, uh, loss of reward. Hebrews 3 references the the fact that the uh, nation of Israel could not enter into the, the rest that God had planned for his people because of unbelief, or one of the versions says unfaithfulness. 
and uh, you miss out on what God has planned, just like his chosen people, the redeemed, forgiven people that came out of Egypt, that he parted the Kadesh Barnea, they didn't make it in. And then once those who did make it in, they eventually lost out and got kicked out because they were still not faithful. God wants us to be faithful or we lose. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 is another passage, the one who was built on uh, the foundation of Jesus Christ with gold, silver, precious stones, uh, will receive a reward. The one who did wood, hay, and stubble, which was the easy stuff, gets nothing because it gets all burned up. So uh, there's good passages on loss of reward, which uh, hopefully will never apply to you. Nor will this one, defilement, uh, Titus gets told by Paul, uh, talking about the Cretans, <clears throat> to them that are defiled and unfaithful, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. And the solution is to rebuke them soundly, so they'll be sound, uh, rebuke them sharply, so they'll be sound in the faith. Uh, what I want to point out here is a condition that you can get into where it kind of looks like you're beyond hope. Um, if your mind and conscience are both defiled, it's like, you know, getting your memory corrupt and your hard drive, you know, sand in it. it nothing just works. You, you can't see, you can't process, you can't even figure out what's wrong because your conscience is seared. It's no longer sensitive to the Spirit of God. People never get into that condition. And then some of the last words of Jesus uh, in also in John, <clears throat> kind of, what profit is it to a man or woman if they gain the entire world and they lose their own life or soul? Or what will you give in exchange for your soul? Soul is life, mind, will, and emotions. And, you know, this made a huge difference in my life when I kind of realized, wow, it's kind of an exchange. I give what I have in this life to get something that I can't lose in the next life. And Jim Elliott said, you're no fool if you do that. So my uh, prayer and hope and desire for all of us is that we would be faithful, we'd be found faithful, and we'd be rejoicing in the presence of our Lord in the future rather than regretting having been not so good. Okay, questions on that or I can dabble on the ones down below. Okay, um, I threw in the concept of ashamed because Jesus talks about those who do not respond to him in following, denying themselves and following him. And you, he says that those who don't are actually ashamed of him. And then he flips it and says, and he'll be ashamed of you when he comes in his father's glory and angels to you know, pass out the rewards. So it's just pure justice that um, those who ignored him get ignored in the future. Um, and it, you look at the guy who uh, at the wedding feast was did not avail themselves of the righteousness that robe that the uh, host offered. Uh, they were bound hand and foot and tossed out. You look at the unprofitable servants who are excluded from the, the big party. They don't even get a slice of cake. No, it doesn't say that. But, um, it's when you you know you feel shame um, when you really um, oh it's this one <sighs> you wish it could have been different. You know you did what was wrong, and it's too late to change it. So that's kind of how some believers you get one shot at this life, and they could count. Um, so you can stand confidently before the throne. What unfortunately has happened is that contemporary Christianity has just totally you know, changed the filters and lenses and everything else so that, oh, we're all ashamed. We can't do anything. Uh, if it wasn't for Jesus saving us, we would be just you know, totally miserable. Well, Jesus did save you. Uh, but you will be totally miserable if you don't obey him because he did say, if you love me, obey me. So rather than move saints to you know holiness, we kind of have uh, made their sin the norm. And uh, 
when that gets exposed, uh, whenever sin is exposed, we feel shame. And you know, some of the, the words for that is like taking a cloth that has uh, folds in it and then opening it up to the, in the light of the sun so you can see every little crease and everything that's in there. And that's a scary thought um, if you're not living correctly. So um, we don't want to be ashamed that is appearing. Uh, it's another, I can't remember exactly right off the top of my head where that is, but there's a verse on that. Uh, actually, it wasn't a man, it was a little servant girl. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he, he feared man rather than God. He didn't trust God. Um, he, yeah, he was, and took a while for, you know, how do you feel when Jesus said three times, well, Pete, do you really love me? Now, Pete, really? And then Peter was grieved as well as, yeah, that's a form of shame. Um, but Jesus had to ask him again for a third time. And he was warned. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's, then you feel triply bad because you had warnings and you missed them. One of the things that's going on with Peter in his defense was that Satan had uh, kind of requested permission to do a number on him, and God had allowed it. Um, so Jesus says, I pray that your faith won't fail, and when you, you know, basically return back, go and strengthen your brethren. So part of it was probably part of God's plan to uh, humble Peter a little bit, take him down a few notches so he'd be a little more tolerable to live with. Um, and then, you know, having had that experience, you know, he, he did just a bang-up job on the day of Pentecost. And uh, I've really grown to appreciate his letters uh, through the years as well. So he was looking, I mean, the, the, the failure goes back even further. Watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. Um, at the garden, remember, he couldn't watch with uh, James and John. Uh, three times, I guess. <laughs> and one of the things that should have been happening in the garden is he should have been thinking through, okay, uh, Jesus is going to die. Uh, what's gonna, how's that going to affect me? Um, you know, had he been paying attention to what Jesus said, it, it just, he had such a, and it's not just Peter. All the disciples, had, because they all ran away, had such a temporal mindset that we want the kingdom now, and they just couldn't quite, get it. They weren't really accurate in discerning what Jesus was saying that, you know, I'm going to get rejected. I'm going to be betrayed, but don't worry. I'll, I'll be back. So that was outside of his experience. He just had trouble seeing that. So um, had he watched and prayed, uh, the situation might have been a little different. He might have been strengthened, um, but most saints through the ages have drawn great comfort to the fact that well, Peter failed and God didn't kick him out. So there's hope for the rest of us. <clears throat> okay, if you're starting out on your faith journey and God says he'll bless you, you don't feel blessed, um, what should you be thinking? You should probably be keen in on the fact that your values and feeling need to get sanctified. Um, you need to kind of match up or compare your um, values with God's values. A uh, major problem tends to be that our values are temporal. We want to feel good and we kind of trained ourselves for immediate gratification. God's value is uh, you know, long-term gratification that really lasts. You know, it's basically eating a you know, plate of whipped cream Versus, uh, you know, getting a cow and having it for the rest of your life. So we need to value what God says we should value. And you see this right in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' first sermon in Matthew chapter 5. And you also see it again in Luke. When he calls the disciples, <clears throat> he gets their perspective off the here and now back to the future. Oh, there's a movie by that title. I wonder if it's a biblical one. Anyway, um, he wants us to kind of look at things from his perspective, not ours. 
so it takes a while. Um, actually, next week I'm going to talk a little bit about perception and performance uh, and emotions and how they all that stuff works and how to try to change them. I'm not promising it's easy, or that I'll have a good solution, but I'll give you something to think about. Um, you know, we basically coming just starting on a system on a, the walk of faith and believing what God has said. We're coming out of uh, a world system that is, you know, 180 degrees turned around from what God wants. So we kind of have to do that, um, be transformed by the renewing of our mind in Romans 12, uh, 2, to value the things that God values. And uh, if you look at the place where the cursor is highlighting, uh, how does faithfulness require submission to God's value system? And wow. Uh, what to do if we don't see the benefit of embracing God's values? Well, we need to look a little closer and figure out how this actually works and maybe study it and talk about it. But submission to God's value system is that the temporal difficulties produce for us an eternal weight of glory. A great passage on this is seen in Paul's life in 2 Corinthians 4 and 5. And if he focused on what was seen, which was the momentary light affliction, he would bail. But instead, he focused on what was not seen, which was the eternal weight of glory, exact opposite of temporal light affliction. Um, so you have to kind of recalibrate your value system so that you value what God values, and that is uh, sacrifice in this life, for blessing in the next. And Satan says, no, no, there is nothing in the future. It's only for the here and now. And I would just commend to you things like, you know, Job, Daniel, um, Joseph, Noah, Jesus, uh, particularly in the book, beginning of the book of Hebrews, uh, in leading many sons to glory, it was fitting that the pioneer of our salvation would be perfected through suffering. That's got to be our value system that, okay, this life is the proving ground for the next one. This life is not all there is. It's the basic message of John the Baptist, Jesus, and the apostles. Hey, repent. The kingdom promised in the Old Testament is coming in which God will reward righteousness. Therefore, get righteous so you can be rewarded. And, you know, through millennia, Satan has chipped away and undermined that thing to the point where people say, oh, there is no kingdom, and oh, it's not worth it, and like, what do they know? Um, but that, that's, you kind of have to say, okay, God's is God, his word is true, he gave it to us uh, to, you know, follow, and it says, this is what the good is, and Satan will say the opposite. So if we don't see the benefit of embracing God's values, we kind of need to go through, you know, just as you read through the scriptures, it becomes really obvious that um, if you're actually reading what's written, um, not just the letters, that um, God's people get tested and tried. God tests the righteous. And the just person is the one who lives by faith in what God has revealed. So that's uh, actually almost another sermon, but uh, that's some of the kernel of it. Good question. Okay, the rest of the questions are on your own. Um, I would encourage you to actually think through them. Even You can even pray over them. It wouldn't be cheating. Uh, and, you know, basically work on hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant, because those words last forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who desires what is best for us, who created us with this eternal plan in mind to bless your people. From the very first words you spoke, you blessed. And the very end words of the scripture, you bless. So help us be a people that are worthy of your blessing because we are doing what you told us to do to get your blessing, which is simply be faithful and true to you. Thank you that you actually make it easy based on your actions in our behalf. The cloud of witnesses that have gone before us uh, both in history and around us in the body. And, uh, of course, the examples throughout all the scripture. Uh, may we be 
ranked among those who are rejoicing in your presence, for you have fulfilled your promises to us. We commit the rest of our day and the rest of our lives to you, to use as you see fit, because you are our Lord and God, and we are your people, the sheep of your pastor. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.